Uh, it's now my pleasure to call Christine Leonard of the Vera Institute to the podium, and she will moderate our first panel discussion. Christine. Good morning, everyone, again. So as our panel uh, gets seated and um, hooked up to microphones so that you'll be able to hear us, uh, I just wanted to, again, uh, acknowledge how much we appreciate all of you for taking the time to join us in this morning's conversation. Uh, we appreciate that Congressman Scott is here. He's really been the conscience and really the, the leader on these issues for so long in the House of Representatives. And we also have staff here um, from Chairman Leahy's office on the Senate side. And as mentioned, um, we do anticipate um, that there may be a few senators who stop by uh, throughout the morning. And as all of you know well, uh, we may pause for a moment during the panel to acknowledge the senators as they're here. Um, they may not have time for questions this morning, but as you all know, I think their staffs have made themselves readily available to us, uh, should you have comments or questions after their remarks. So this morning, um, what we really wanted to do uh, after we heard from the Attorney General and had another opportunity to hear about the important work that the Justice Department is doing, and in particular, uh, their plans to implement the Smart on Crime Initiative, is to take a moment to reflect um, and hear from some of the leaders in the field from a diverse range of perspectives. Um, I think uh, it's really great, uh, the panel that we've got here before you this morning, because I actually do believe that there is hope for common ground on these issues. And, and I actually think it comes from some very unlikely sources. And it's exciting, I think, to take a look at where we can find common ground um, among unlikely alliances, let's say. So to just take a moment to introduce uh, our panel to you, um, I'll, I'll introduce them in the order to which they're seated. And um, just to give you a brief sketch of how we plan to proceed, uh, we'll have some questions that I'll present to the entire panel. And then we're going to take a, a, a moment um, for each of them to provide some of their own reflections. And, and really our goal here is also to allow some time uh, for all of you to participate um, because uh, as I look out at all of you, I, many of you have decades, uh, not to age any of us, um, of experience in this field. And, and really I think um, we are at a, an, an interesting time. I, in, in many ways um, there are different forces that have pushed us to the moment that we're in today um, in both uh, fiscal considerations as well as perhaps a tipping point in terms of the ramifications of some of the policies that have been on the books. But I think for many of us that work and think about these issues every day, it was really a moment to take a step back and reflect when the Attorney General of the United States said in August that the status quo is unsustainable. And I think many of us have felt this way about the work that we do for a very long time. But we got that leadership recognition from the top. Now it really comes for all of us to come together to find ways to bring some action and meaningful changes to the policies that stand before us. And as the Attorney General recognized this morning, it's certainly very important to think about what happens when individuals coming out of prison are reintegrated into our society. But I think through today's panel discussion, what we also want to think about is, are some of these individuals even appropriate to become part of the justice system in the first instance? Are there better policies that could be implemented? Should we take a hard look, as members of Congress are already beginning to do, about the, the laws that are on the books that bring these people into contact with these harsh sentences in many cases, and as well the states that have been leading the charge in the area of reform well before the federal government in many substantial ways. I also think it's a really meaningful opportunity for us to think about the ways that the Congress is taking a hard look at what happens in our federal prison system, whether there are substantial programming opportunities for the individuals who are facing long sentences, and then of course through the work of many of you here today, we do have an opportunity to talk about reentry into our community and what that means and how that can become a path for people to get back as productive members of our society and our communities, but also more importantly to return to their families. So with that said, we are very fortunate to have the panel that we have with us today. Laura Murphy is in her second tenure as director of the ACLU's Washington Legislative Office, and we are just really incredibly lucky to have her with us this morning because she has really crossed uh, over so many issues during her tenure, um, both working with the Congress and the Obama administration to advance the ACLU's public policy priorities. Um, she was a key player in the passage of the Fair Sentencing Act of 2010 signed into to law by President Obama on August 3rd of the same year. And she has had both experience 
in the advocacy community as well as within government and in running her own uh, policy making firm, Laura Murphy and Associates. So thank you, Laura, for joining us today. And uh, it's, it's with great pleasure that I get an opportunity to introduce Craig DeRoche, uh, the president of the Justice Fellowship, again this morning. Um, as many of you hopefully know, and if you have not had the opportunity yet, I hope you will uh, today to get to know Craig. Um, he's quite an impressive tenure already, despite his useful appearance. At the age of 34, he was the youngest statewide Republican leader in the country and elected to serve uh, by the majority caucus to serve as Speaker of the House of Representatives. It's important also, I think, to take a moment uh, as we have these conversations that all of us come to this for uh, perhaps driven by our own personal life experiences. And Craig has been very open about the fact then in 2010, he also made headlines, but it was for an unexpected uh, reason. He had two alcohol-related arrests, and then that brought him uh, forward to keep us uh, in, in terms of revealing a secret he had kept uh, for many years. Um, he had gone into rehabilitation, which he may speak about today, and uh, also regained a renewed focus on his Christian faith. Um, I'm very pleased to say that Craig is a good friend, and he has uh, very successfully been battling his struggle with alcoholism over the last several years, um, and also very significantly has become a leading voice in the discussion around criminal justice and his role at the Justice Fellowship. And in this capacity, he's been the president since last year, but I've got to say, even in this short tenure, Craig is here in Washington more than he's at home with his family in Michigan. He is here really making an effort to see that the ideas and goals that his organization supports and advocate for inside our system are also seen on the national level, but um, he's been a very active player in a lot of the legislative proposals being considered by the Senate and the House right now. Um, thank you, Craig, for joining us today. And then to uh, Craig's left, uh, I, we're pleased that Rabbi Lipskar is here with us this morning as well. Rabbi Lipskar is the executive director of the Miami-based, internationally uh, known Aleph Institute. For the many of you that may be here today, you may work on these issues every day and have not had the good fortune to know about Aleph's work. They have created and implemented a host of programs that provide alternatives to incarceration, rehabilitate inmates, counsel and assist their families, and provide moral and ethical educational programs. The rabbi's work with this organization began, began way back in 1995, and he's been involved closely with the organization's efforts since that time. And he's been the executive director since 2003. He has overseen and expanded all aspects of the organization's program development, their communications, their government relations, and I will say, you know, and hopefully he'll share with us today, they maintain a very active dialogue with the Bureau of Prisons regarding uh, individuals who are the Jewish faith, but they also are very welcoming to other prisoners and to hear their concerns and to advocate for them within the system. On a, on a daily basis, they are providing professional services to nearly 4,000 men and women in federal and state prisons across the country, and there are approximately 25,000 spouses, children, and parents left behind. So, uh, and then uh, my friend John Malcolm is here as well with us today. As many of you hopefully know, John oversees the Heritage Foundation's work to increase understanding of the Constitution and the rule of law. He's the director of the think tank's Edwin Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Prior to this, John's had a very distinguished tenure in the criminal justice uh, arena. He was spearheaded the center's rule of law programs. He's very well known for his uh, research and writing on a broad range of topics outside of criminal law, including immigration, national security, religious liberty, and intellectual property. He comes with the, to this topic with a great deal of professional experience and uh, firsthand uh, in contact with the system. He was the Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Department of Justice Criminal Division from 2001 to 2004. From 1990 to 1997, John was the Assistant U.S. Attorney in Atlanta, and he was assigned to the Fraud and Public Corruption section, where he, and then he also uh, worked at an, an independent counsel in the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So I thank them all for joining us today. And, uh, and with that, I think we'll turn it over um, to start off the conversation. Um, we're going to present a, a question to each of our panelists, and I hope that all of you in the audience will think about this as well as we get back to questions in a moment. 
Um, but it's been three years since the passage of the Fair Sentencing Act, and, and I'll tell, tell you that uh, for many of us, uh, that was quite a remarkable um, moment in the Senate Judiciary Committee when that bill came forward. Um, there's been a long track record in the House and the Senate when criminal justice bills come up that there's always a flurry of amendments and everyone thinks, oh no, we're done. It, it, this will never happen. And it really was a rare moment where both sides came together and had had agreement on how to move forward on our broken criminal justice system. So I, I'd like to ask the panel, with all the bipartisan support that we saw then and that we're beginning to see now, it seems like there's opportunities to pass legislation on sentencing reform, perhaps conditions within prison at the federal level, as well as reentry, to take another renewed focus uh, on the Second Chance Act and its implications. However, this is Washington. How can we use this moment to build a sustained national commitment to improve justice for all, and if the panel could please comment on what you think the potential landmines are as we think we should avoid as we move forward in this dialogue. So I'll start with Laura, please, thanks. Thank you, Christine, and I'm, I'm very honored to be here. And I think you raise a very important question about where do we take this moment. And I just want people to know that the ACLU is trying to take advantage of this moment in the aftermath of the Fair Sentencing Act by an initiative to end mass incarceration. And um, I noticed when we were taking pictures with the Attorney General, there weren't very many women in the picture. I think I was the only one. But there are many women at the ACLU who are responsible for doing this work. I'd like Vanita Gupta to stand, who's our Associate um, Deputy Legal Director, and Jesslyn McCurdy and Kara Dansky. Our th thesis. <laughs> Uh, Jesslyn used to work for Congressman Bobby Scott, and um, she, before that, she worked for the ACLU, and like me, she came back. But um, our thesis is that there has to be an integrated approach, taking advantage of this economic moment as well as this political moment. There are 20 states that have worked to reduce uh, the number of people incarcerated. And in many of those states, it's a partnership with left-leaning organizations and groups like ALEC that made those changes possible. So I think we've got to get over our um, need to be right and to uh, get people to do all of these things for the right reasons and bring people together and say, for whatever reasons, whether it's budget cutting, whether it's um, fairness, whether it's racial justice, we all have a common goal, which is to reduce the number of people incarcerated. And because it's, it's abysmal what's going on in this country. So I think um, we've got to reach across party lines. And it's often thought that the Democrats are very, very liberal on these issues. But if you look at the Senate Judiciary Committee, you know, you have some de Democrats on that committee like Senator Schumer and Senator Feinstein, who are very difficult to get on these issues. So we have to do three things. <coughs> we have to rein in the power of prosecutors. We have given prosecutors the unintended consequences of stiff sentences are that prosecutors, rather than judges, get to make determinations about the fate of uh, defendants in this, in this nation. And they have way too much power, and we've got to rein them in. And even as the Attorney General has rolled out the smarter, uh, Smart on Crime initiative, we're seeing resistance in the rank of the US attorneys, which is something that we have to remain focused on. The second thing we have to do is to um, pass the Smarter Sentencing Act. And we have to pass it and get it in final form without the additional mandatory minimum sentences. And I want to thank Congressman Bobby Scott for being willing to take a leadership role on this issue and for being such an absolutist when it comes to mandatory minimums. Um, and then finally, we have to end our addiction to incarceration. I mean, we have to internalize that these long sentences are not making our country any safer, any healthier, and any better. So that's what we have to do. 
Well, thank you, Lauren. And, and again, this morning, I think we want to see where we agree and perhaps where we may have some disagreement. So I'm going to skip <laughs> down the line to John to respond next, please. <laughs> well, uh, let me begin by saying that one thing that we should recognize is that this is, in fact, a bipartisan issue. As you can tell from you know, the, the people up here in the dais, the attorney general that you've heard and some of the speakers you will be hearing from, uh, suffice it to say that you know, the, the groups on the state frequently have areas of disagreement that outweigh, or outnumber, I should say, our areas of agreement. And in fact, I will make no bones about the fact that I have heard things already on the stage here today that I, uh, I disagree with. Uh, but I will say, I heard the Attorney General when he said, quote, that our commitment to the cause of justice must remain constant. And I heard Wade when he said that our criminal justice system must be more just, humane, and efficient. Uh, and I certainly agree with those sentiments. Uh, I think that we need to have an open and a frank discussion about these issues and one that is not uh, tinged with overheated rhetoric or overly partisan uh, rhetoric. I don't think, for instance, that uh, everybody who thinks that we incarcerate too many people or keep them incarcerated for too long, uh, I don't think that they're soft on crime or that all they care about is mollycoddling uh, criminals. And I think it's also important to recognize uh, that people who think about putting public safety first and who believe in uh, strong sentencing, and by the way, who also believe in uh, felony disenfranchisement uh, laws, that not all of those people are racist or unfeeling towards their, uh, towards their fellow man. Uh, but look, you know, there are, if you're looking for landmines, to me, the biggest landmine is that we will miss this moment by, in, by using labels and accusations and using rhetoric that will divide us rather than unite us. Now, I think we have to deal with the reality uh, of the situation that we have, for instance, an awful lot of criminal laws and regulations that are fairly arcane. Some are quite clear. But those arcane ones uh, can, can prove a trap uh, for the unwary. And I think we also have to deal with the fact that these are tight budgetary times. Federal prisons are now uh, 39 percent overcrowded. It's worse than the state court systems. The BOP takes up 25 percent of the Department of Justice's budget. That number is growing. Uh, and during these times, we need to be very, very careful about who we incarcerate and how long we sentence them for. And we also need to be very careful about once people are in prison, trying to make them into productive citizens and, and considering how long we keep them uh, incarcerated. If you send you know, the wrong kind of person to jail for too long, uh, that uh, takes up investigative resources and prison cells uh, that could be better utilized to put people who richly deserve to be behind bars there. Now, you know, I have a great deal of respect for the career prosecutors who are resisting some of these changes. Uh, for seven years, I was a career prosecutor uh, myself. Uh, but in, you know, in, in my opinion, when it comes to some of these mandatory minimum sentencing, not necessarily all, the pendulum has swung too far. Uh, and that certainly the Smarter Sentencing Act is a very measured and appropriate response and a good place to start. Thank you, John. And we, this wasn't even intentional, but I, I think we're turning things on the head already and then we've got John seated way down to the left, Laura's here over the right, and then we have our, our <laughs> nice distinguished guests here in the middle. Um, so Craig, uh, w what could you add at this point? Well, uh, Ben Jealous used to introduce me as the, uh, his right-wing extremist friend, but today I'll be just right of center. <laughs> Just briefly about Justice Fellowship, Chuck Colson founded us uh, in uh, 1983, and my joke is uh, how I got involved in criminal justice reform, you've heard a little bit, is that Chuck Colson would do anything uh, for the prisoner and uh, to reform the criminal justice system, except with 60 to 80 percent of the people in the system having problems with addiction, he never took the time or trouble to get addicted to anything, so God brought an alcoholic to the ministry. Um, uh, at Justice Fellowship, we continue in the tradition that Chuck Colson had and that we are those people. Uh, nobody likes being called uh, one of them, but increasingly in America with 65 million Americans that have criminal records, uh, uh, those people are, if, if it isn't people like me, it, it's our uh, uh, spouses, it's our kids, it's our nieces and nephews, our neighbors, uh, folks that we love and care for. And that's why I agree wholeheartedly that this is a bipartisan issue. Um, speaking to the momentum of the Fair Sentencing Act and, and where you build on that, I would um, offer to this audience and, and to the other panelists that we are talking about a values discussion. And I don't mean that in a heavy-handed, 
uh, um, way of, of saying my values over yours. Uh, the Attorney General described it earlier as democratic values. Others would describe it as uh, the values that they've learned and enjoy and practice in their faith. Others would, would call it morals. But we have shared values. And that is what I think unites us in this discussion. And as, as um, we go forward, I think the point that John uh, was making was one of the biggest pitfalls, and I'll agree with him, is, is when you start uh, judging other people's principles or values. You know, what's bringing uh, the likes of Rand Paul and, and, and uh, Senator Leahy to the table on these issues is that they're sharing uh, principles and they're respecting each other's principles that have brought them to the table. And I think that that's where the momentum lies and the opportunity. As far as pitfalls go, um, I, I wrote a little list. Um, mm. Pity-based, uh, waiving or omitting responsibility. If you do that, I believe that you deny the person the growth that they receive through accountability, whether that be spiritual or practical growth, treating people uh, differently um, without a nexus to public safety. All of those things have blocked reforms in the states and, and in the Congress. Thank you, Craig. And I think it's also important, the voice that you bring to this as far as the values, but we also have the facts on our side. And I think that that's another way to hopefully find consensus among folks who may come to this issue for different reasons. But again, um, it's a way to keep people together and hopefully keep the conversation level-headed. And uh, that's where Rabbi uh, Lasker may ha be able to help us as well. Thank you so much. And uh, Christine, thank you for the endless hours and good work that we did together in promotion of these ideas. I'm going to speak specifically to the issues of reentry, um, because uh, Aleph has, was founded over 30 years ago, back in 1981. And ever since then, we have been very focused on the idea of reentry, long before reentry became a popular concept, which is more recent, and taking a look at the individuals that were being incarcerated in a holistic way. Um, today, as we progress, we're, we're, we're coming around to that idea, but more and more we have seen that it's only towards the end of sentences or within a short period of that time that many of these opportunities and programs and guidance are being provided without really taking a hard look at the individuals from the moment that they come in, looking at their familial situations, looking at each one of them as an individual. The statistics are there that when there's a spouse that goes to prison for a year, and more, a year or more, in most cases, that ends in about uh, 70 to 80 percent in divorce. Um, the challenges that that creates, uh, not only for the incarcerated individual, but for that spouse or for the, the children, which are now more likely to end up in that situation, are increased. So taking a look at these important programs that need to be made available and the need, important opportunities which uh, do reduce recidivism are, is very, very important. And specifically, what we can do is talk about some of the uh, pending bills that are uh, both the twin bills in the House, which is Bill 1783, which is the Federal Prison Reform Act, as well as the, uh, the, the House bill, which is 20, uh, 2656. And I'm happy to see that Congressman Bobby Scott is here, who's you know, very involved in, in, in the sponsorship of that bill, which is there to uh, enact and bring into law the opportunity to give incarcerated individuals a chance to earn credits through participation in positive programming, through participation in vocational types of uh, training or other types of psychological or counseling programs to give them an opportunity to earn credits towards earlier incarceration. And I think that what that... Early release. Not early, release. Uh, <laughs> early release. And, and getting out, say, er, early release and getting out into uh, the halfway house system far sooner. Um, and I think that with the introduction of these programs, uh, we will see not only addressing the issue from a budgetary standpoint, addressing the issue from the overcrowding standpoint, um, it will certainly do a lot to, to reduce um, crime as a whole. Obviously, this comes first and foremost by focusing on safety and security, but I think that with the introduction of these things, we will find that to be a reality. I think the pitfalls and the landmines that we have to avoid with this is that we don't restrict the language of these bills and the language of these laws. We need to be bold and courageous. These are common sense laws, and I think we have to make sure that they are available to as much of our prison population as possible. Unfortunately, we've seen certain laws passed uh, in the past that were too restrictive and didn't really 
provide the opportunity for enough people to participate in this program. So I think for us to be successful with this, we have to take a strong stand, a very open-minded stand, but also be very focused that the programs that we are going to put in place will be something which will give the necessary guidance, tools, and, and fundamental needs to these individuals to come out and be productive. Well, thank you for bringing that up. And, and again, to recognize Congressman Scott's tenacity and that this probably is one of the first times that there has been federal legislation looking with such scrutiny at the opportunities for individuals um, to earn uh, opportunities to perhaps uh, be released or, or to receive incentives because of the program that they participate in. Um, but really, you know, it's also important, as many of you know well, but for us to remind many of our colleagues here in Washington that the states have been engaged in a lot of these initiatives for some time. And so we're now going to ask the panel, um, each of you, and I think I'll just start down in the end with John, to talk a little bit about um, how the states have been able to pioneer these efforts and, and invest criminal justice dollars back into evidence-based policies. What are some of the drivers that have brought them to these changes? And how do you see these efforts affecting change at the federal level? Sure. Uh, well, in a very real and positive way, uh, as Justice Lewis Brandeis once said, states are, are, you know, can be laboratories of democracy. They are, of course, uh, separate sovereigns. They have primary authority under our Constitution for uh, providing police power to, uh, to protect us. And in local communities, it's in local communities where the impact of crime is most profoundly felt. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's only natural, really, that states and localities have taken a leading role. Uh, in terms of trying different types of reforms, some on the front end having to do with diversion programs, alternative sentencing, some on the back end in terms of you know, risk assessments, letting people out early, uh, dealing with probation violators in different ways. People here are probably familiar with the HOPE uh, project that was started by Judge Stephen Alm out in, in Hawaii. Different states are experimenting with that. And that's all, I think that's all great. I think that the, the federal government needs to take a look at what's happening uh, in the states. They should consider uh, funding and adequately funding uh, research and pilot programs for these things. You want to find out whether these solutions are scalable. You want to find out whether they work in all environments. Maybe some solutions work in certain states or urban areas and others work in rural areas. You want to find out whether they work for all kinds of, uh, of offenders. And this is a very exciting development. And, and as, as long as people are praising you, Congressman Scott, let me say that I am delighted that the House Judiciary Committee has reauthorized its uh, task force on overcriminalization and overfederalization. And I, and I know my colleagues, look forward to continuing to work with you on the very important work of that committee. I'm just going to speak for a moment specifically uh, to one state in particular that I think uh, we can look at as a paradigm of uh, the success of what I, was, what I mentioned earlier and the importance of the bill both in the Senate and the House to pass with very broad opportunity. If you take a look at the uh, Texas Department of Corrections, um, a number of years ago they passed uh, bipartisan law to, incre to increase programs for the reduction of uh, recidivism and to increase um, opportunities, as we spoke about, for earned credits for early release or early release and positive reentry. The and they they increased it up to a possible 50 percent off a person's sentence. The facts are that the Texas Department of Corrections. Spent, the government spent $250 million on this program. To date, that program had saved them $2 billion. And for the first time in Texas Department of Correction history, or in they were able to, two years ago, close a facility and reduce recidivism by 16%. So the facts are that given the right laws, given the right opportunities, it works. And given the budgetary con concerns, both on a federal and state level, I think that if the federal government does take a closer look at what some of the states are doing, um, some of the great success has been the faith-based institutions. I think the faith-based institutions provide an opportunity for the individuals that choose to participate in that program with a, with a great chance to really take a better look at themselves, a great sense of community while incarcerated, which is something which is very difficult to come by. And that prepares them for the idea of being reintegrated back into our communities and the importance of how that has to continue. And because of the inclusion of 
uh, non-government agencies and other religious organizations to come in and participate in these programs and mentor the individuals that are going through this program. It also gives that transition back into the community a great opportunity and I would encourage the federal government to take a look at that and the laws that they have in place which allow those that go in to mentor um, inmates the opportunity to continue to guide them after they're released which can only stand to uh, make sure that they will be successful in their reintegration and reducing the recidivism. Um, I, I agree that this in many ways is, is already occurring and I agree with your assessment on Texas. Interestingly, um, when we had uh, prison fellowships, uh, IFI, our, our faith-based prison there, uh, graduation ceremony, uh, uh, former Texas governor uh, and president, George W. Bush, gave um, uh, the address. So he, he's still um, talking all these years later about the things that were put in place when he was governor back in the 90s. And uh, that's blazed the trail, and there's other people in the room, like Richard Jerome with the uh, Pew Center on the States that have focused on state reforms. And we're finding them at, at Justice Fellowship to be very helpful and informative with uh, Congressman Scott, Congressman uh, uh, Chavitz, uh, the companion bill with uh, Senator Cornyn of Texas um, introduced uh, um, to, to make these type of reforms with the reasoning being uh, behind the success of what they've witnessed in the states. And just as uh, the federal government in the past has looked to the state's experiments with welfare reform or Medicaid reform when the transition occurred uh, to HMOs, these scary, untested things, is this going to hurt patients? Is it going to hurt doctors uh, 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 with welfare? Is it going to um, uh, cut people off from the workforce and further impoverish them? The states were able to demonstrate metrics and demographics that inform the federal leaders and we're seeing uh, not only from the groups that are on, on this um, panel today, but many in the audience, I, I want to congratulate and thank you for that because you're, you're really blazing the trails um, for these federal leaders to be successful, which is what we want them to be as they venture into this space. Um, the uh, Right on Crime movement, um, I'd like to just mention uh, that briefly. Um, I'll put that hat on. I'm a signer of that, as was Chuck Colson while he was alive. Um, uh, was started by the Texas Public Policy Foundation and supported by Justice Fellowship and uh, has really helped uh, transfer from state to state a lot of these ideas. And, and we believe uh, similar coalitions and collaborations as they're forming up at the federal level uh, are going to help bring the best of what's occurring in our country forward into federal law. Thank you, Craig. And so, as I said earlier, um, one of the things we hope to do in this morning's discussion is to allow each of our panelists to respond to some general questions, but then also allow each of them to provide uh, in further depth some of their own perspectives on these issues uh, from the representation of the organizations that they bring. Um, at the moment, uh, we have uh, the good fortune uh, to be joined by Senator Lee, and so I'm going to turn things over to uh, viewers, President Nick Turner, uh, to introduce uh, the senator, and then we'll turn back to the panel after your remarks. Thank you, Senator. Hello again, everyone. Uh, we are delighted to have Senator Mike Lee with us this morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, senator Mike Lee was elected uh, by Utah in 2010 to serve in the United States Senate, and today Senator Lee is a member of the Judiciary Committee, uh, Energy and Nat Natural Resources, uh, and the Armed Serv Services Committee, as well as the Joint Economic Committee. He received his Bachelor's of Science and Juris Doctor from Brigham U uh, University and went on to clerk at all three levels of the federal judiciary uh, in the district court with D. Benson. And then you had a double with Sam Alito, both on the Third Circuit and at the Supreme Court. Uh, the senator spent several years as an appellate litigator at Sidley and Austin and was general counsel to Utah's Governor John Huntsman. Uh, today, Senator Lee is the lead sponsor of the Smarter Sentencing Act, which we've talked about quite a bit uh, this morning, and along with Senator Durbin. Uh, and this is a bill which will provide federal judges more discretion uh, in sentencing nonviolent drug offenders. And so with that, Senator, I'd like to welcome you to the podium and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. It's a real privilege to be with you this morning. Uh, I want to begin my remarks today by telling you a story, um, uh, a story 
of an event that happened last summer. I was driving with my family last August when all of a sudden I got a call from my assistant uh, here in Washington saying um, uh, that, that the president wanted to call me. And my first reaction was, uh, uh, the president of what? Um, <laughs> I, I, I get a lot of calls from a lot of people uh, who are presidents of various organizations. And um, uh, she politely informed me that she was referring to the President of the United States. Um, th this was an interesting time for a call uh, 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 from the President of the United States. We were right in the middle of an effort that I had been involved in, involving uh, the uh, proposed defunding of Obamacare. I had recently published a book entitled Why John Roberts Was Wrong About Health Care, about my disagreement with the Chief Justice's reasoning in NFIB Sebelius. And um, uh, my assistant didn't say what the president wanted to talk about. Uh, she said only that I should stay near a phone uh, for the next 45 minutes to an hour. I felt a little bit like I was back in school and like I had just been called into the principal's office. Um, it, except, of course, the principal, at least the principal at my school, uh, uh, didn't have nuclear launch codes. <laughs> <laughs> and add to that, neither the president nor uh, myself are, are, are what you would call glad-handing, uh, back-slapping politicians uh, along the order of, say, Ronald Reagan or Bill Clinton. Um, so in short, this was shaping up to be w what I expected might be one of the more all-time awkward conversations in the history of the telephone. <laughs> but it wasn't. Um, quite to the contrary, it turns out he was just calling to talk about an issue that's near and dear to both of us, uh, which is criminal justice reform, and to thank me for the work that I was doing. And he pledged his support uh, to help me get something passed in Congress on this issue. Now, when this happened, the earth did not stop spinning on its axis, uh, and, and dogs and cats did not start living together in the streets uh, spontaneously. <laughs> But that day, I knew the political ground had shifted and criminal justice reform was finally on the table. It was on the table in a very real, very significant, very bipartisan way. I know that other speakers today have, uh, 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 or perhaps will, address specific provisions and strategies to reform sentencing, incarceration, and policies regarding reintegration. So it, with the few minutes that I have, <clears throat> I'd like to explain why I'm involved in criminal justice reform and why I think conservatives have such an, an important role to play in this particular debate and why it is that more conservatives ought to get involved along with people uh, uh, along every step on the political spectrum. America's criminal justice system is, in my opinion, in need of reform not because current policies have failed, uh, but in many ways because those policies have succeeded. Let me explain what I mean. This is an important point for reformers to recognize. Uh, prevailing law enforcement strategies have helped make communities safer all around the country. And yet the current system, for all its merits, nonetheless leaves too many Americans behind. Some of them are reformed offenders who are left behind languishing in prison. Some of them may be innocent men, women, and children on the out outside of the prison walls, uh, trapped in fraying communities with too little security, and far too few fathers, uncles, and other brothers. A generation of tougher on crime policies has created new challenges that it's up to our generation now to meet. Now to meet, hopefully, with the benefit of those fathers, those sons, those older brothers, those younger brothers, all of whom are, are desperately needed in their own communities. We have the challenge of over-criminalization, of over-incarceration, and over-sentencing. We have a mountain of empirical evidence demonstrating the social and economic value of stable, intact families and the costs of the breakdown of those same families. We have prison policies that make rehabilitation the exception rather than the norm. And we have regulations that make it unnecessarily difficult 
for even reformed offenders to build a new life and to earn an honest living once they have been released from prison. As a conservative, I believe the purpose of government is to protect and promote our free enterprise economy and our voluntary civil society. America's two networks of human opportunity where individuals come together to meet each other's needs, improve each other's lives, and help themselves by participating in a system in which they help everyone else. These networks cannot function at all. They certainly cannot function properly when they're threatened by violent predators. And so society certainly and quite properly reserves the right to incarcerate them. But nor can our free market and our civil society properly function when people are unnecessarily excluded from fully participating in a free market economy and in our voluntary institutions of civil society. And so incumbent in the power to punish crime is the corresponding responsibility to sentence offenders on an individualized basis and for a period of time that extends no longer than necessary. And it also includes a commitment to rehabilitate as many offenders as possible to prepare them for full reintegration into our economy and into our society. And if reformed offenders can be restored to the families and the communities that we know so desperately need them, while at the same time freeing up additional resources uh, uh, to prosecute serious crimes and incarcerate th those criminals that need to be incarcerated, then the moral argument for such restoration is no less compelling. Whether they know it or not, all Americans have enjoyed the benefits of a generation of tougher law enforcement policies. But when benefits diffuse, costs are usually concentrated and almost always among the politically marginalized and economically vulnerable in our society and in our economy. There are families and neighborhoods across the country who have borne the brunt of these high costs. For instance, if you brought together all the children in the United States with a parent in prison, they would make up a city roughly the size of Chicago. That's significant. That's stunning. That ought to be of concern to every one of us. These children and their families and their neighborhoods too often find themselves locked in a different kind of prison, uh, one without the physical walls and the barbed wire that we commonly associate with our penal institutions. Uh, prisons of poverty, of instability, of immobility, and of isolation. Criminal justice reform is good policy. It would more efficiently allocate prosecutorial resources and lead, I believe, ultimately to fairer outcomes within our criminal justice system. But the real benefits of criminal justice reform won't be found necessarily just in government budgets or even in courtrooms or even just in prisons but in homes and in classrooms and churches and sidewalks within neighborhoods where hope can finally start to make a comeback. Criminal justice reform is not so much about letting people out as bringing them in. To craft policies to help reformed offenders and their families fully participate in our society and in our economy and to help build an America that gives them opportunities the same opportunities that all of us want for ourselves. Thank you very much, and I wish you the best of luck in this conference. So thank you so much, Senator Lee. Uh, it has been incredible to have the new energy leadership and determination of both the senator and his staff, Bryson, on the committee. Um, before we turn back to the panel, uh, we are going to just take another moment for uh, Nick Turner to recognize uh, another member of Congress that's joined us. Thank you very much, Senator Lee. That was a, a very mo moving and, and provocative uh, talk. I now would like to welcome, as I know all of you do too, uh, Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky. 
The senator was elected to the Senate, as we know, in, in 2010, and he serves on the Federal Rela uh, the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, and the Small Business Committee. Uh, Dr. Paul graduated from the Duke University uh, uh, School of Medicine, and he practiced ophthalmology and probably perfected ophthalmology in Kentucky for the last 17 years. Um, he has founded a clinic that provides eye exams and surgery to needy families and individuals, and continues today to provide pro bono eye surgery to Kentuckians in need of care. Uh, Senator Paul, uh, as we have spoken about already, uh, is the co-sponsor of the Smarter Sentencing Act, as well as the lead sponsor of the Justice uh, Safety Valve Act, along with Senator Leahy. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Senator Paul. Thank you for being with us here today. Thanks for having me. I'm a, a little annoyed that I have to go after Mike Lee, all right? <laughs> so we both have mandatory minimum bills, and of course his wins, and <laughs> I'm getting second fiddle. But uh, no, we're excited that really there's so much momentum that there actually were two reform bills on mandatory minimums. His is a little bit different, but his actually has some advantages over mine in that it actually gets rid of some mandatory minimums, where ours was simply changing it to give uh, the judges oversight. Um, and ours would have been all crimes. His is going to be limited to, uh, uh, believe, just drug crimes. But uh, I think the, the question and the principle of whether or not judges should be involved in trying to find justice is a very important one. I think when you tell someone that they would be sentenced to prison and that it's automatic and that the judge has no discretion over it, I think most people recoil at that. I think once you add in some of the people and some of the instances that of what have happened, people very much recoil at that. And I'll give you a couple of examples. John Horner was a 46-year-old father of three, decided to sell some of his painkillers to somebody. Unfortunately, it turned out they were an undercover agent. Uh, he was turned in, pled guilty, and was given a mandatory minimum of 25 years in prison. Now, in my state, you can kill somebody and be eligible for parole in 12 years. So you sell some painkillers and you're in for 25 years with a mandatory minimum. Something's wrong with that equation. Edward Clay was an 18-year-old first-time offender who was caught with less than two ounces of cocaine, received 10 years in jail. First offense, mandatory minimum. Weldon Angelos, 24, was sentenced to 55 years in prison for marijuana sales. 55 years in prison for selling marijuana. Federal Judge Timothy Lewis recalls a case where he had to send a 19-year-old to prison for conspiracy. And the conspiracy thing in general ought to be looked at. The RICO statute has just been way overdone and is used. I know a guy, I don't know him, I know of the case of a guy who was given conspiracy to violate the Clean Water Act. And you say, well, what was he doing? Was he dumping benzene in the river? No, he was putting clean dirt on his own land to raise the elevation so he could sell it, but he was given 10 years in prison. His partner was 80 years old, given 10 years in prison, all for conspiracy. And here we have conspiracy, and this young 19-year-old man was in the car with someone who has drugs. So they're all wrapped up in a conspiracy because he's in the car with uh, someone who has drugs. Uh, I think that when you look at this, the thing that gets to me is that, and uh, you can get some of this from reading Michelle Alexander's book on mass incarceration and the new Jim Crow, is that you know an enormous amount of people are in prison for this. And when you think about it and you think about, you know, there's a lot of discussion in our society about voting rights. You think that in my state, one in three young black men are unable to vote because of a felony conviction and they never get it back. One of my neighbor's brothers sold uh, marijuana plants in college 30 years ago. He has an MBA and his job is house painter because he can't get a job because he's a convicted felon. There's a lot of things that need to happen here. Mandatory minimums, to me, is the tip of the iceberg, the beginning of what we need to do. I'm also in favor of uh, giving people back the right to vote in my state. My state's one that never gives you the right to vote back. So I'll be testifying next week in Frankfurt before the state legislature, and I will be testifying in favor of restoring voting rights for, for nonviolent felons. <laughs> Thank you. 
We will also very shortly be introducing legislation at the federal level. There's some other bills, but we're going to have a bill that will be introduced shortly that will do the same for federal rights. The, uh, there is somewhat of a distinction now. The Supreme Court in a couple of cases has made a distinction between state voting and federal voting and saying that state legislators can do, legislatures can restrict or have rules on voting, but the federal voting has to be equivalent between, the two, between all of the states. So we think there is a need at the federal level to do this. We also are active in expungement of records. They're doing it at our state level. We're trying to do it here. What we think about expungement, though, is that it would be better off if it were never there. So what we'd like to do is take a lot of things that are considered to be felonies, nonviolent felonies, drug possession, make them misdemeanors so you're never caught in the trap. Because if you do expungement, it may well work, but once it gets out on the Internet and people do a background check, you may still be considered to be a felon even if it's been expunged. That may work to a certain extent, and I'm, I'm for going in that direction. But rather than just do that, what I would do is go ahead and make some of these things misdemeanors, and then they would never be on your record. As I've become more active in these issues and listen to people who have been caught in this trap, I've become very aware that there is a cycle from, from, from poverty to drugs to prison, but also non-payment of child support back to prison. And I think that's something that we have to address as well in this, because you put a guy in jail who's 20, 21 years old and has two kids, and he comes out of jail three years later with $3,000 worth of child support payments, he's never going to see $3,000 in his life. He's lucky to get a minimum wage job. So as much as I think a lot of us in the crowd and a lot of us should pay child support if you have kids and you should be punished, if you can't get a job, you shouldn't be able to go be put back in jail for non-payment of child support. So this is a big cycle that I want to be part of trying addressing and letting people know that there are Republicans on our side that will work with Democrats who will work to try to do the right thing on this. This is something whose time has come. It's also something where the, most of what we're seeing is the unintended consequences of well-motivated people. Because you'd say, well, gosh, some guy makes $200,000 a year and he's not paying his wife because he's, he's mad at her over a divorce, not paying for the kids. That should be fixed. Deadbeat dads should be prosecuted. But it, what happens is then a lot of people get caught up in this who can't make the payments. So I think we do need to address this. And um, I think that uh, it's something that needs to be addressed no, not only at the state level but at the federal level. And I'm happy to be part of this. I think Mike Lee's bill, actually, I think it's cleared the committee now, has a very good chance. We've got a champion in Senator Leahy who, on our side. And I'm not sure where things stand on the House side. But on the Senate side, I think these things can pass. And that the main reason for it happening is the majority of Democrats, but now we're getting at least a minority of Republicans coming along on these issues. And to me, it's sort of the best part of bipartisanship. It isn't that we come halfway to each other and split the difference on things. It's that we can have people on the right and left who passionately believe in the same thing, and you can get something done simply by throwing away partisanship and saying, what's the right thing to do here? I hope to be part of that, and I'm very happy that you invited me this morning. Thank you. Um, so thank you everyone and I think uh, we will all probably find some common agreement on the fact that regardless of speaking order that Senator Paul has already become quite a trailblazer here in Washington and has graciously agreed to take uh, a few questions from the audience so we do still have I think microphones that we can pass around um, and anyone would like to uh, ask the uh, senator a question we can take a few right now it's a very shy crowd of hard-working souls. Yeah, only easy questions. <laughs> Here's one in the back. Uh, look, is that... And if you could please introduce yourself since we are video, uh, have a video of the event. Thank you. Hey, Senator. I'm John Gramlich with CQ Roll Call, uh, and I'm just wondering if you could explain oh, more... Except for reporters. No rep I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> wondering if you could just explain specifically what the legislation that you're planning to introduce would do. Is that the Democracy Restoration Act or a version of it? Well, uh, we have a Civil Rights Voting Restoration Act that's going to be introduced, and the only thing that's complicated about it is we've chosen to do just nonviolent crimes. So you have to figure out what they are, and then you have to have some oversight by the Attorney General to look through, because we're talking about all the state laws, too, all the state felonies. There's federal felonies or state felonies, 
But we think that if you've had a nonviolent felony, we're forgetting your voting rights. Now, there is one by Senator Cardin that includes all, and I'm just not quite there yet. And I think that's the one you may be referring to. I think it's easier to start out with some of the, the nonviolent felonies and try to get restoration of voting rights back. But there can be an argument made for once you've served your time, you've served your time. But I think as far as trying to get the coalition necessarily to pass this, uh, that uh, we're looking at nonviolent felons. We also have another bill that will be in we haven't got all the language yet. It's either going to be expungement and or making some of the felonies, federal felonies, into misdemeanors. I think that would help. I think our society is going. And I'll give you one quick example of this. People think, oh, conservative Republicans and stuff just want to put people in jail forever. There was a discuss there's been discussion of, on several of our presidents on whether or not they use drug use. So about in 2000, they were discussing a Republican, they said whether or not he used drugs when he was a kid. And uh, this was Cal Thomas, Pat Robertson, and Jerry Falwell, three very conservative Christians. And they asked them, if it was someone in your church caught with marijuana, would you rather them get incarceration or counseling? And all three of these conservative Christians said counseling. It's the common sense answer that most people would say. I think we're headed in that direction where it doesn't have to be acknowledgement. Some want to say it's fine and it's okay to use drugs. I'm not there. I think there still is a problem, and, and you shouldn't be using illegal drugs. However, I am for uh, a, a much more humane re response to this and giving people a second chance. And a lot of these crimes, uh, what we consider to be crimes, I think are committed by young people who, you know, they say uh, males don't really have our brain developed till we're about 25, and there's some, there's some truth to that. But I think after 25, people will tend to be involved less with this kind of stuff. But somebody who made a mistake early, I think, ought to get a second chance. We may have time for one more question here in the front. If you could just introduce yourself as well, thanks. Hi, thank you. My name's Brian Harris with Interpress Service News. Um, I was wondering if you would be able to comment at all on uh, the for-profit prison system and for-profit prisons and if that, uh, what your opinion on its role in the criminal justice system is. Yeah, I saw an article the other day on this where a guy had a $200 civil fine and then his probation was like $360 a month from a private, uh, you know. There are things that probably can be contracted to save money, but when you're talking about a person who has a $200 fine and then has a $360 penalty, or no, I think he was having to pay for, home, for the ankle bracelet and everything, $360 a month. A lot of these people don't have any money. And so his fines added up to $1,000. Then I think he was put back in jail for non-payment. So absolutely, we need to look at this kind of stuff. And this isn't the free market. Prison is not the free market where you have to have everything with, uh, done privately. If you can do some stuff to save money, I'm for that. But you have to recognize that a lot of people that are arrested are very poor, and that if you put penalties on them, and then we're sending them back to jail for non-payment of penalties, or that's a probation violation, I think that's a big problem. I think most of that state, but I don't know if any of that can be addressed uh, federal. I guess for federal prison, it could be looked at federally, but I'm open to looking at that as well. Thanks, everybody. So uh, it seems uh, only appropriate that uh, after hearing from Senator Lee and Senator Paul, uh, we will turn it back over to Laura Murphy from the ACLU. Um, and, and again, just to take a moment to step back and think about that, as Senator Paul described in Kentucky, that a lot of the, what's percolating at the state level has really been a, a major driver for federal legislators to think about these issues and to know that the steps that they may be taking here on the federal level actually reflect a lot of the conversation and dialogue and perhaps uh, political will that has already taken place on the state level. So Laura, as you mentioned, um, Vanita is here who has led a lot of the work that ACLU has done in the states. She's worked closely um, along with Peggy McGarry who, McGarry, who is the director of Vera Center on Sentencing and Corrections. Uh, there's, there's just an incredible amount that's going on in the states right now. And so Laura, if you could speak to that. But I think also just to, to keep our conversation going forward, is that in addition to the states, um, Laura, especially from your perspective and experience, if you can talk about sort of the more global values piece of the conversation that Greg alluded to earlier, which is how can we make criminal justice an issue that's at the forefront of the American consciousness? I think it's very powerful that we've heard from the Attorney General and Senator Lee and Senator Paul about their willingness to address this cr criminal justice problem as part of a, a national priority. 
But in addition, how do we take it to the level, and perhaps again with the media here today, that makes it a top fold issue like poverty, immigration reform, and, and national security? How do we better help Americans understand the intersectional nature of these issues and so that we can ad advance a common agenda? So Laura. Thank you. I, I think that's a great question. I think we have to continue pressure in the state. But I am shocked by, in, in my lobbying efforts, how so many members of Congress don't know what their state legislatures or governors have done. I mean, and it doesn't resonate with them as a mandate. And so I think we really have to continue the state work, but we have to really emphasize that that work needs to be transported uh, to the United States Capitol. And uh, legislators need to, to know, federal legislators, need to really understand that there is a major shift going on in the population when it comes to attitudes toward incarcerating people with small amounts of drugs or for nonviolent offenses. I think, frankly, that in some states and in the, in the Congress, that the legislators are trailing behind the actual public, that the public is getting their heads wrapped around these changes much more quickly. And I would like to suggest that those of us, of us on this panel agree to meet with the House and Senate Democratic and Republican leadership because we've got to get floor time for this Senate bill. And we've got to talk to Speaker Boehner about freeing up Chairman Goodlatte to give time to mark up this legislation, the Smarter Sentencing Act. And I think that if we continue to tell the stories at the state levels, to talk about the reduction in crime, let's just take South Carolina. They made two big changes in 2010. They eliminated mandatory minimums and reduced sentences for many first and second time offenders. And, by, and they eliminated the disparity in sentencing between crack and powder cocaine. And what has happened since then? Violent uh, and property crime rates are both down. 800 fewer people in South Carolina prisons are there for drug offenses, which is, represents a 16% decline. And they've closed two prisons in the last two years. So I think we have to have a steady drumbeat, and we've got to take our drumbeat, not just to the wonderful co-sponsors of these, legislation, these pieces of legislation, like Senator Paul, Senator Lee, Bobby Scott, Senator Leahy, and others. We have to take it to the House and Senate leadership from organizations on the left and the right and say, look, this gridlock in Washington is stopping us from pushing values-based legislation. It's stopping us from saving money in the Bureau of Prisons. And it's stopping us, for a dismantling, stopping us from dismantling a system that gives prosecutors way more power than judges. And as last time I checked, the judiciary was a co-equal branch of government, not prosecutors. So um, I think we've got to um, move ahead um, in a more united fashion. And I invite my colleagues from the left and the right to have these lobby visits before the end of, of March, let's say, and, and go in and talk to the leadership so that they will encourage the committee chairman to pass the bill in the House and also encourage giving floor time so that we can take these state reforms to the federal level and we can demonstrate that there are, is not a political consequence that they will face in, in November for supporting this kind of bipartisan legislation. Well, thank you, Laura. I think, though, it's important to acknowledge that um, it's certainly not for lack of trying, that there haven't been staunch voices, uh, often rather solitary over the past two decades, who have sought to seek this kind of change. And I, I would just, again, acknowledge Congressman Scott is here. You know, perhaps what's news is not that these ideas are out there. I mean, Congressman Scott, uh, for decades, has been pushing for this type of sensible reform. But for perhaps one of the first times, 
It's not in an environment where we're seeking to also block legislation that would make things worse. Um, and that so much energy over the years has had to be expended in that direction um, of policies that would actually move the pendulum in a different direction. And as John referenced earlier, that perhaps this is a moment where the pendulum's swinging the other way, and, and, and perhaps uh, through good advocacy, um, there can be some change. With one exception, I don't think people know that the fastest growing prison population in the federal system comes from border crossing offenses. So the Latino population is skyrocketing. And we tend to see criminal justice over here and immigration reform over there. And the two meet up in some very pernicious ways. And so when you hear greater border enforcement, you're talking about more arrests, more prosecutions. And the state, uh, you're not entitled to uh, counsel in deportation proceedings. And you're supposed to get counsel for the criminal offense. But the state of public defenders along the southwest border, they're, they're overwhelmed by their dockets. So we have a pro-crime bill in the form of the Senate passed version of comprehensive immigration reform. And we need to go back to our Democratic and Republican officials who support immigration reform and say, let's not make this as bad as the crime bill of 1994. And it could be with the amount of enforcement and punishment that is going into border protection. Well, and I think and, and, uh, immigration uh, had moved through the Senate and has paused in the House. It's a good uh, example of why we need to think about uh, where we can find bipartisan uh, support for these initiatives in a way that can continue momentum. And I'd like to turn it back to John hmm. to perhaps comment about the different stakeholders that maybe needed uh, for continued conversation around criminal justice at the federal level, particularly our nation's prosecutors and the law enforcement community who also are on the front line. Um, and, and John, what are your thoughts uh, about uh, some of the comments that we've heard, but also in those stakeholders in particular? Sure. Uh, I'll leave immigration reform alone. Um, look, I think it's important in terms of, of carrying this momentum uh, to career prosecutors, dedicated public servants in the law enforcement community who strive every day to keep us safe. Uh, you know, they're going to have to be convinced through reasoned arguments and hard data uh, that these kind of reforms are not, in fact, going to increase the risks to public safety, and that if done and implemented properly, can in fact reduce the risks uh, to public safety. I think that we have to acknowledge that under these reforms, that there are going to be people who get a break who are going to recidivate. But we also need to point out that this is going to free up resources uh, so that we can truly focus on, on, on violent predators who belong behind bars, and that some of these reforms are also going to decrease the likelihood that nonviolent offenders are going to recidivate and will increase the likelihood that they will become law-abiding, uh, productive members of society once they are out. Uh, a number of these reforms can enhance public safety, they can be cost-effective, and they can prove uh, to be humane. As the Attorney General said in his remarks, he, vast majority of people, I think he used the figure 95%, I don't quibble with that number, I'm sure he's right. The vast majority of people who are imprisoned today are at some point going to be let loose into society. And it is, as a result, in everyone's best interest that those who pose the biggest threat to public safety uh, remain behind bars for as long as necessary, and that those who are released are given a fighting chance uh, to reintegrate themselves into society and to become law-abiding, productive, uh, productive members. And, and you know, people who spend their careers catching bad guys and putting them behind bars, uh, and I was one of those people for a significant period of time, uh, require some convincing. Uh, but the data is there, and reasoned arguments can be, uh, can be made. Uh, and I think that through that, we can make some significant progress. Thank you, John. And I just, Rabbi Lesker, you spoke earlier, earlier about the legislation introduced by Congressman Chaffetz and Congressman Scott on the House side relating to what happens in order to prepare 
or perhaps support individuals before they return to our society in the, in the numbers that uh, both John and the Attorney General mentioned. Um, with the work of the Aleph Institute, I was hoping that you could speak more um, about the specific programs uh, that you referenced in terms of what type of work uh, you're doing inside of facilities right now, but then also where do you see right now the opportunities perhaps um, in tandem with any momentum on the Hill that the Bureau of Prisons could take uh, actions immediately uh, to uh, improve its uh, opportunities for individuals that are incarcerated at the federal level, um, but then also mindful of the costs that could come with any of those types of changes? Well, in terms of um, looking at the reduction in inmate populations in the state systems uh, versus the increase in the federal system, for whatever reasons there might be, um, and the discussion that the federal system should be taking a look at what the states are doing, we could say the reverse in terms of um, some of the programming and, uh, that's available that the Bureau of Prisons have implemented and been you know, very forward thinking, especially with the current administration in terms of trying to create practical programs that I would encourage the states to look at and try to incorporate as well. Practically speaking, these are uh, programs that we refer to as the Yeshiva in Prison, it's a, or um, uh, Prison Fellowship may talk a little bit about their Kairos programs. These are in-prison programs uh, which are very hands-on, which are tailor-made to the participants of the program. Uh, there's a application process, it's open to all, but there is an application process of each one of the participants to understand uh, their background, the level of education, the types of, um, uh, the nature of their offense, to make sure that we're partnering them with the right mentors, we're bringing them the right guidance and education that they need in their particular set of circumstances, uh, taking a good look at their family situations as well, so that when we tailor make these programs to them, um, we know that we're helping the individual. We're not just throwing a bunch of information at a person hoping that some of it sticks. There, of course, is the importance of preparing uh, the individual for when they leave prison uh, practically uh, in terms of working with the communities, in terms of job placement and other types of opportunities, but it is during this time that, they're, that they are incarcerated that we need to encourage um, more and more availability um, an opportunity for these hands-on and educational types of programs. As you said, this uh, does increase the challenges to do with staffing, um, and we have found that the chaplaincy departments and the religious departments and the education departments within the prisons um, are learning to become more accommodating, and the administrations are working to try and find alternate um, opportunities for other uh, people within the prison to oversee these, these, these programs. But there are other areas where I think that uh, the Bureau of Prisons can certainly uh, do a little bit more, although they are doing as quite a bit right now. There's um, the residential reentry centers, um, which are available. We'd like to see them utilizing that opportunity more. There are the RDAP programs, um, which uh, would like to see that people can be achieving the maximum amount of um, earned credit available under the guidelines of those programs. And then practically speaking, to do with uh, certain uh, visitation policies that have been implemented recently, um, as well as um, restriction on communication with family. I think that with an increase in that area, which does pose a little bit of an increase in cost because of the staffing requirements, we will see a much greater return. But then there's also areas with, within technology that is being used on the state level, uh, video visitations, video conferencing types of educational programs that I think that if they're more open to incorporating some of those programs, we will see um, both reduction of cost and of course reduction of our inmate population and a successful transition of, of reentry. Well, thank you. And as John mentioned earlier, and uh, we have colleagues in the Justice Department here with us today, um, given the Bureau of Prisons' uh, sizable portion of the overall uh, Justice Department budget, these are very pressing and timely issues. Uh, we're also going to be joined shortly by Senator Whitehouse, who has also introduced legislation with Senator Portman on the Senate side that is not identical to the House measure um, put forth by Congressman Chaffetz and Scott, but would address this topic and um, should be considered by the Senate Judiciary Committee this week. He's been negotiating closely with Senator Cornyn 
and many others uh, to see where there could be bipartisan agreement on this area. So I think you know it's important to remember um, as there can be a lot of room for disagreement around how to approach these issues that you know, many of our panelists here today have a lot of direct experience um, through the work that they're doing um, about how these challenges have presented themselves to individual families and individuals currently incarcerated. And I think Aleph in particular has done a lot of work around family visitation and access to phone calls, access to lawyers. It's an important resource as the conversation continues. And similarly, as Craig has already uh, spoke to about uh, already briefly, the Justice Fellowship, you know, is an, an interesting organization and dynamic in that they're here uh, in Washington uh, influencing national policy, but also across the country. Um, they have state chapters that are working very diligently to try and see reform at the local level. Um, and Craig, I wanted to ask you to speak a bit about overcriminalization, especially of nonviolent offenders. And I think uh, we've heard a lot today about the hopes uh, uh, and opportunities that may exist, but it, it, there's always the challenge that perhaps it would be done in a piecemeal fashion. And I wonder what your thoughts are um, as a former legislature and your a legislator and in your current seat now. What are the chances for any type of comprehensive uh, reform, and what do you think those uh, priorities may be? Well, um, when it comes to overcriminalization, I, I believe that. Um, it's it's the unintended consequences and as a speaker of the house at at a state level um, 10 years ago I, I uh, got to see those firsthand and, and uh, uh, you you have the, that's the largest body in, anywhere in this country or, or in the nation's capital and you have priorities that emanate that that are valid uh, um, of some form of criminalization or, or penalties uh, for what that representative uh, uh, values and, and but too often we allow these things uh, to be granted the status of a crime uh, without thinking through the mens rea, um, you know, the, the, the criminal intent. Uh, we allow them to go on the books as policy uh, for all of time. Uh, we, we, we've um, uh, let our uh, system where some people have commented here about indigent defense, and I'll, I'll com comment on that too, because I do believe it's related in overcriminalization, is that you've taken away the check and the balance. You've given the government all the cool toys. They get the tanks and the helicopters and the infrared cameras and everything else all the way down to local towns with a couple thousand residents now. But to stand up to that government on, on laws that, that would never pass if, if they were put to that township for a vote, um, you, you can't mount uh, an adequate defense. So um, I think that the overcriminalization properly starts at the federal level. Um, I think the states are better at revisiting it and, and they have consistently stepped up to the plate over the last 30 or 40 years. But uh, seemingly uh, uh, it, at the federal level, the, these things are um, untouchable. And so one of the techniques that I used to use when I wanted to touch things that were untouchable as a political leader was to couple them with the things that the legislative body that I led wanted. And, and that means that a comprehensive approach is the way to do it. Uh, if, if you have uh, um, reforms that people are yearning for in the Democratic and the Republican conferences, if they want to vote for those and they want the opportunity to make them a law, you clean up the messes of the past, you put sunset provisions in, you do the things that you have to do. And absolutely, um, I believe that time is right for the president and the speaker who seem to be the ones that share the stage whenever there's a, um, a, a, a conflict over budgeting. Uh, they should let the public know and their conferences know that this is on the table and that they're gonna come out of the room and, and to transfer these bills to uh, not just be a, um, a, a straight up vote on, on a, a policy um, as, as Congressman Scott and, and others have, have toiled after for years and years, but to shift it and elevate it to say this is an implementation bill. This is part of a deal. If you vote no on this implementation bill, we can go back to talking about raising taxes or, or cutting education or some of these other areas, or you can be a part of the team that supported the overall package and I think that the time is right uh, federally and, and with the minds and the organization and the work of, of leaders like uh, Congressman Scott over the years and the, and the, and the fresh voices um, and the impact that this has. Again, not losing sight of the impact on the communities and the families. Senator Lee highlighted um, 
that, that I think if, if, if those um, uh, uh, changes are made to elevating this to comprehensive uh, looks, as well as elevating it to the discussion of the structural changes that are needed in, in D.C., we'll have more success and you'll see things pass even yet this year. I, I, we like that optimistic uh, and strategic perspective. So we're, we're going to go rapid fire through our panel here um, to talk about what are, as Craig just mentioned, what are the priorities that could happen within the next month, six months, both legislatively and administratively. So we'll start with you, Laura. So I think it was very interesting, uh, Assistant Attorney General Cole's remarks about um, petitions for individuals who are in the federal system to get them released. And, and you combine that with the fact that President Obama commuted the, the sentences for um, nine crack offenders, at least four of whom were serving in prison with, uh, uh, for forever, life without the possibility of parole. And so I'd like uh, for the Justice Department to come up with a methodical system for processing what uh, Cole asked of the legal community because we're all in a flurry to figure out how we get these individuals um, out um, of federal custody. But I think the president should use his commutation power for, a broad, for broad classes of individuals who are in prison for nonviolent offenses. And we just, the ACLU just produced a report on life without parole, the opportunity for parole. And we have over 2,000 individuals in the federal system, half of whom are serving, um, well, more than half, who are serving because of nonviolent offenses. So the government could set up a mechanism to work with us so that we could help identify individuals who are there for nonviolent offenses and the president could commute their sentences. And I think that that would be a very important landmark statement on the part of this president. So thank you, Laura. And, and the attorney general and the deputy attorney general have been very vocal in recent weeks about the issue around commutation. Um, that may be some, uh, an issue that our other panelists may have different uh, opinions on. So let's just go quickly, uh, Craig, Rabbi, and, and John, if you would speak to, to what, what you think are the top priorities, uh, and, and then we'll, we'll hear from uh, Senator Whitehouse in a moment. Top priority is um, bring victims back into the debate. Uh, too often that is left out. That is a check and a balance against the government. The government tries to play and co-opt the role of victim to justify the expansion of the government's powers and the enforcement of the laws that are already in the books. Uh, victims have a story. We should embrace them. We should bring them forward. Uh, children with incarcerated parents. We know this firsthand. A prison fellowship, hundreds of thousands, over 400,000 families that, that we do work with every year. Uh, Senator uh, Lee and, and others spoke to this. It's an important thing that I think would get bipartisan support in Congress. And lastly, uh, while Senator Whitehouse is in the room, breaking down the silos of education and health care and criminal justice when you're dealing with mental illness and addiction, like Senator Whitehouse is talking about with a, a, a uh, schools for uh, high schools for kids that are in recovery for addiction is an excellent idea. It is related to criminal justice, but we treat each one of these things as different silos. We've got to cross over those, and that can start this year. That's great. And there were some colleagues here from the Department of Education earlier who have been working with us on a, a correctional education right now. I think that's a very important priority that can happen without congressional action, but only enhance. <laughs> Go ahead, right. um, You know, I'm going to echo some of the same sentiment, sentiments uh, with regard to commutations and uh, the office of the uh, pardon attorney's office to really take a better look at increasing commutations. I think that that is uh, certainly something which could be very positive in the appropriate cases. Um, the aspects to do with um, preventative measures within education, I think that if we address this for and if we really focus on creating the curriculums and the programs within our schools uh, to educate our young people um, in a better way. The preventative programs that are out there will certainly be a great answer to not having to look after the fact at these situations. But while we're waiting for some of this legislation to pass, and hopefully it will be done in the right way, 
we have to increase the opportunity for alternative sentencing, which is something we're very involved in. And working with the U.S. attorneys, working with the Department of Justice, working with the probation department, and of course with federal judges to really uh, utilize when it is at their discretion, when they are faced with um, uh, sentences which have the opportunity to depart from the guidelines or have a variance um, and include alternatives and other means of holding people accountable other than just incarceration. Um, and in many of these cases where they are nonviolent um, offenses, I think that we can really utilize the opportunity to help these individuals grow, to give back to the community, and to not overcrowd and, and overpopulate our, our, our prisons. And I think that will require uh, a lot of focus on educating um, our judges as well as to what goes on beyond their courtrooms and what really happens in prison with these individuals because the only time they ever see them again is when they're sending them back to prison. Thank you, that's important. And so John, we'll let you have the last word. Sure. Uh, one aspect of the Smarter Sentencing Act that hasn't been addressed is Section 7. And by the way, we have a couple of papers out front uh, on, this, uh, on the Smarter Sentencing Act. Section 7 requires the Attorney General uh, and all federal regulatory agencies to identify uh, what crimes exist in both the criminal code and the code of federal regulations and the mens rea that is involved and within a couple of years to make those crimes, a list of those crimes, publicly accessible so that people actually have a fighting chance of being put on notice as to what is unlawful and could land somebody in jail. Uh, I think the Congress needs to look at the back end of sentencing by studying uh, the role that risk assessments might play in the criminal justice system and the robustness of risk assessments. And finally, the single biggest thing that Congress could do at the moment to address the overcriminalization problem is to pass a default mens rea provision. Thank you. So at this point, uh, I'll turn the mic back over to my, uh, Nick Turner uh, for introductions. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Uh, and so I'd like to welcome, if I could, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island. Uh, Senator, we are delighted to have you here today. Uh, the senator was elected in Rhode Island in 2006 and is a member of a uh, number of committees, the Judiciary, EPW, the HELP Committee, and is chairman of the Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime and Terrorism. Uh, he is a graduate of Yale University and the University of Virginia School of Law. And uh, as John Malcolm was talking about, how so many people who are involved in this work have spent a long time as, as prosecutors uh, providing for public safety and, um, and advancing that, that cause of justice. Uh, the senator has done that just in Rhode Island as well as the U.S. attorney under President Clinton as well as being the attorney general. So we're very pleased to have him. Uh, the Senator is the lead sponsor of the Recidivism Reduction Public Safety Act, along with Senator Rob Portman, and is also a co-sponsor of the Smarter Sentencing Act. So, uh, Senator, welcome. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Nick. It's a uh, pleasure to be here, and I'm uh, delighted and honored to be here with my colleague from the other side of the building, Representative Scott and um, to have a chance to participate in today's conversation. It's been uh, about a half a century now that the Vera Institute has been a constant voice of reason and fact in our national conversation on the meaning of justice. And the leadership conference continues to play a vital role in so many of the important debates in Congress today. Together, your work has challenged long-held notions about crime and punishment in this country, leading to reforms that improve the fairness of the criminal justice system, save taxpayer dollars, and strengthen communities. These contributions have been a valuable resource to those of us in government working to, as we heard the Attorney General describe, get smart on crime. Although I realize that smart might not be the first word that jumps to mind when someone mentions Congress, there are encouraging signs that perhaps the worst of the Washington standoffs may at last be behind us. Last month, we were able to pass an omnibus spending bill that will keep the government open for this fiscal year. Now that we've managed to perform that most basic responsibility, we can <laughs> focus on perhaps some of the other long-term challenges we face. And few of those challenges are as important or as difficult as the unsustainable growth in our federal prison spending. 
You've all heard the statistics. We now have well over 200,000 inmates in the custody of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, each costing $29,000 per year on average. When you factor in the cost of the Marshal Service, we will spend $8 billion this year keeping federal prisoners locked up a 20-fold increase since 1980. To put these numbers in context, spending on incarceration is now more than 30 percent of the Justice Department's budget. We spend more on federal prisons than we do on the DEA, the ATF, and all federal prosecutors put together. And since 2000, the amount we spend keeping federal prisoners locked up has doubled while federal funding for state and local law enforcement has been cut in half. So the crowd out effect on other public safety programs is very real. This unsustainable growth in prison spending has made one thing clear. We cannot incarcerate our way to keeping the public safe. Money that is spent locking up a low-level offender for longer than necessary is money that cannot be spent on FBI agents, prosecutors, crime victims, or local police departments. State leaders, including in my own state of Rhode Island, and a big shout out to our corrections director, uh, my friend A.T. Wall, uh, have had to deal with this reality years ago. We were faced with a choice, either keep spending money building additional prisons at the expense of virtually every other law enforcement priority, or figure out a way to control corrections costs without jeopardizing public safety with organizations like the Vera Institute providing extremely valuable support, Rhode Island and other states took the latter path and pursued data-driven corrections reform. We examined sentencing policies, beefed up reentry assistance to reduce recidivism, and offered alternatives to incarceration for some offenders. To address the unique needs of certain populations in the criminal justice system, many states expanded drug abuse recovery programs and created specialized courts, such as Rhode Island's innovative Veterans Treatment Court. Some states, including Rhode Island, offered inmates the opportunity to earn earlier release from prison in exchange for completing courses proven to reduce the risk that they would commit future crimes, such as drug treatment programs and vocational training programs. These reforms produced results. Rhode Island has seen a 9% decline in the state's prison population, matched by a 7% decline in the state's crime rate since enacting our reforms in 2008. Other states, such as Texas, Kentucky, Ohio, and Arizona, had similar outcomes. This story is one of the most underreported successes of the past decade. The states are ahead when it comes to criminal justice reform, but some of us in Congress are trying to catch up. As you all know, the Senate Judiciary Committee recently passed the Smarter Sentencing Act, authored by Senator Lee and Senator Durbin. This bill reflects the common sense approach to sentencing reform that has worked so well in our states. It reduces some mandatory minimums, but only for nonviolent drug offenses. Drug offenders are 50 percent of our federal prison population, and there's no way we can bring prison spending under control unless we find a better way to focus our resources on those offenders who represent the most serious threat without wasting money locking up lower level offenders for years longer than is necessary. In addition, I've worked with Republican Senator Rob Portman of Ohio on legislation to reduce recidivism by requiring the Bureau of Prisons to expand programs that have been proven to cut the risk that inmates will reoffend when they are released. In exchange for taking real steps to reduce their recidivism risk, our bill offers inmates a modest sentence reduction. It's based on the simple recognition that nearly every inmate in federal present prison will be released at some point. And we are all better off if they get out a little earlier, but with a lower risk of committing more offenses. If they get out later, but immediately go back to committing crimes, nobody wins. For the past several weeks, I've been working closely with Senator John Cornyn, the Republican whip, on a bipartisan compromise in this area. Senator Cornyn and I are both former attorneys general, and we share a common recognition that out of control prison spending doesn't make us safer. It actually makes us less safe. 
Before I close, let me add one thought, and that is that we need to make sure we're paying attention not just to the inmates and their transition from custody back out into the community, but also to the communities that receive them. If you look at the map of Rhode Island and you focus on the zip codes and you plot into each zip code which ones are getting the bulk of the released inmates, you will see that there is a small number of zip codes that carry an enormous burden of having to deal with this population and help support their reintegration into society. We've gotten used to that being something that we ask of these communities, and frankly, that is wrong. If you tried to shift it to other communities, they would go berserk. And it is really important that we kind of recalibrate ourselves and make sure that the communities that are very heavy recipients of people coming out of prison get the support for those communities that they need as well as the support for those inmates that they need. The developments in Congress that I talked about are promising, but we shouldn't be naive about the path forward. For a lot of elected officials, it's always going to be easier to talk tough on crime, even if it means making us less safe in the long run in actuality. I am proud that 13 members of the Judiciary Committee voted for the smarter approach and supported the Durbin-Lee Bill. Our recent progress is in part a testament to the hard work that all of you and so many others have put into this effort to lay the foundation for that legislative work. That work, however, is just beginning. We've been successful in large part because criminal justice has so far not become a partisan issue. Indeed, a lot of the old partisanship has come out of that issue. So even as we fight over Obamacare, unemployment insurance, and the IRS, we've been able to make real progress in this area because both parties have taken ownership of it. Whether we succeed in the end will largely depend on whether that continues to be true. But if states as diverse as Texas and Rhode Island and Kentucky and Ohio can find ways to control prison costs while better protecting their public, then surely we in Congress ought to be able to do the same. So I thank you all very much for your leadership on this issue. I look forward to continuing to work with you to make these results possible and to improve the public safety of our communities the smart way. Thank you. Wow. Please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking Senator Sheldon Whitehouse for those extraordinary remarks. Thank you so much. It should go without saying that we look forward to working with you, uh, Senator Mike Lee, Senator Rand Paul, Congressman Bobby Scott, and others in the pursuit of bipartisan criminal justice reforms. And thank you all, all four of you, for your extraordinary leadership in this area and bringing so much to the table today. Wow, what an incredible conversation we have had this morning about criminal justice reform. First, I want you to join me in thanking this incredible panel for their great work this morning. To Craig DeRoche, President of Justice Fellowship, to Rabbi Aaron Lipsker, the Executive Director of the Aleph Institute, to Laura Murphy, Director of Washington Legislative Office, the ACLU, and to John Malcolm, Director of the Edwin Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies, and the Ed Gilbertson and Sherry Lindbergh. Uh, I'm sorry, Gilbertson, Gilbertson, Gilbertson. okay, senior <laughs> legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Thank you all for doing it. And for our wonderful moderator, Christine Leonard. Yay. Really, this was an incredible panel. Now, I have been asked to uh, sort of bring a formal closing, uh, and I'm going to be extremely brief. This was just a wonderful conversation. I think it's fair to say that this discussion has unearthed what I would call a propitious moment in time. 
uh, for politics around criminal justice reform. And in fact, I'm even tempted to go back to my early flower child days and call this an harmonic convergence. <laughs> this, is, this is really quite an extraordinary conversation. So I want to start by thanking uh, the Dean of Georgetown Law Center and the Law Center for making this impressive facility available to us this morning. Thank you, Dean Trainer, for your good work. I want to thank the extraordinary staffs of the Vera Institute and of the Leadership Conference for your incredible effort to make this a successful presentation. You guys did an outstanding job, and really. Nick and I are the beneficiaries of your good work, so thank you for helping us look good, but truthfully, you all did the work and we owe you an extraordinary debt of thanks. Now, I, uh, I'm gonna revert to something I've seen Joe Scarborough do on his uh, show, Morning Joe, which is, what have we learned? <laughs> okay, what have we learned today, guys? So I have sort of five things that I took away from this conversation. Uh, first, criminal justice reform is a national civil and human rights issue, a national s political and economic issue, not a partisan issue. And what we've heard expressed by the members of Congress who were here, by this great panel of activists in the field from the left and the right, helps to reinforce the fact that this really is a national issue that brings together an extraordinary set of interests that have worked or could work in harmony to achieve a substantial uh, reform and change. Uh, secondly, as several speakers have mentioned, those who are currently incarcerated will be released. They will be back in communities from which they come. Often, as uh, Senator Whitehouse said, they're gonna be concentrated in certain zip codes that reflect the poverty and a lack of educational attainment and a frustration in dealing with the you know, conflicts that result from having been incarcerated and the burden imposed both on those communities and on the society in general are extraordinary. Unless we begin focusing our attention on how to mitigate those pressures, how to alleviate some of those pressures, they will only grow worse, they will intensify to the detriment of the country as a whole. Uh, third, this has to be a data-driven conversation. Vera has specialized in presenting data, and I think our panelists have talked in many instances about the data that's available to reinforce their arguments. But I also think there is great power in personal stories. Personal stories help bring to life the real meaning and impact of some of these policies help expose the unintended consequences that policymakers invariably produce when somewhat casually, they put together proposals that are obviously long on the time served and less invested in reforms that could help make that a productive period. So I think uh, that's really true. Uh, I also think it's really important for us to recognize uh, that the states and local communities are often well ahead of the federal government in promoting reforms that work and that we should look at what the states are doing to help really identify the best practices that might be brought up for discussion in the context of federal reform. From what I've heard here just today, I know that many states are engaged in the kinds of reforms we'd like to see adopted at the federal level, but without that information being made available to us, often we tend to ignore it when conversations at the national level occur. And then lastly, and for me, it's really the most important of the issues, which is in coalition there is strength. If you're not pursuing coalition politics in the 21st century, you are not pursuing the politics to prevail on issues of importance to us. What you saw here today was the making or the continuation of a left-right coalition that came together to help produce the Fair Sentencing Act in 2010 a left-right coalition that has extraordinary power if it were to use its contacts in a way that helps to advance commonly shared policy prescriptions. And I think that what makes this discussion significant is that we hope to use all of the elements that we've identified 
in a comprehensive way to really make the kinds of specific reforms that my colleagues here have discussed. So with that in mind, I hope you would agree, we take away a number of concrete ideas uh, for reform in the future and the good work that has already laid a foundation for the change we hope we can accomplish. So lastly, please join me in thanking yourselves for all the effort that you have brought to this discussion. We appreciate your support. We appreciate your leadership. And thank you so much for coming.